All right, Tom, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about what were your influences? Where did you start? Um, primarily, I think uh, growing up was uh, Jacques Cousteau, probably those films, uh, Wild Kingdom, anything, you know, animal related. Um, from as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to be in the water, under the water. Um, I barely, I can swim, but I'm not uh, proficient on the surface, so I'm much better under the water than I am on the surface. But uh, um, so those were probably my early influences um, in terms of feature films. Uh, probably uh, the James Bond Thunderball sequence, Thunderball, which yes. is probably you know. Everybody, you know, watches features. That's one of the most iconic underwater scenes ever. And um, I eventually, some sometime after that, got to work with the uh, the director of photography for that underwater sequence, which was kind of a, you know, nice thing to have happen in your career. Um, and then um, just other films over the years, The Abyss, uh, in terms of lighting, it term, for me that was one of the um, one of the best underwater uh, films in terms of lighting. I don't know about the story per se, but uh, in terms of underwater, it really leaped forward in terms of uh, cinematography. Working underwater, the way the lighting was done, the way it was, uh, the lighting was you know kind of motivated to instead of just throwing light onto right. a set, <clears throat> it was really kind of well done in terms of. Mikhail Solomon, who was a DP, it was just phenomenal. Right, and very sourcey light. Mm -hmm. and, uh, True. Uh, yeah. A lot of technical um, setups yeah. that were involved and, in that. Yeah, thing. and I mean, because a lot of times people will light just, they just set lights on the bottom of a tank if you're working on a tank, and they'll just mm -hmm. set them up in different places, but they're not really motivated. Whereas with that, with the, the deep core, using lighting, you know, especially when they're out, out outside of the, uh, the, the station, you know, using source light coming from like the ports and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, that would at two thousand feet, you don't see anything. You don't get any light. So right, and even the wide shots were spectacular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, and so, how did you end up at Full Sail? Um, I've been in the diving business for quite a while, and. Uh, I started out shooting stills. Uh, I thought I was going to go into the still business, and um, I, at some point, I was working in Boston. Then I moved to uh, New York and was working in New York at, at, with a diving company. And um, I just realized I wanted to move. Stills was really competitive, so I figured, well, you know, I'm pretty good at what I'm doing now, but I wanted to do better. So I started taking some classes in cinematography. I took a couple classes. Mm -hmm at NYU, <clears throat> and then um, my brother, who w looked at Full Sail, and he was gonna come here for the recording arts, told me about it, I came down, did the tour, and I decided that, that was, you know, the place to be. You got your, uh, you know, I liked the idea that it was a one-year curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked the idea that it was practical and hands-on, and I got to play with all the different film cameras and things like that, for those of you who remember film. Right. Um, so we got to do all that, and uh, I just felt I needed something more formal, um, better credentials in terms of just, you know, instead of just flying by the seat of my pants, I had something to back it up, and that's why I came here, and I really enjoyed it. Great, and uh, so as you left Full Sail, what, were, what was your first break into the business? Um, my first break was actually working with uh, Jordy Klein up in Ocala. I worked as his uh, worked as a safety diver with him initially, and then eventually I became as a uh, worked as an AC, uh, loading the uh, the film magazines and prepping the cameras and getting them ready in the housings. And then at that point, I decided I got stars in my eyes and I moved to LA. <laughs> and yeah. uh, struggled for a few years in L.A., mm -hmm. and then uh, my big break came when I got uh, the job on Crimson Tide. I was essentially hired as a PA for the underwater unit, and they brought me on because of my underwater diving background, and, um, and I was also going to be babysitting the director of photography. He would just gotten certified to do the underwater shooting aspect of that show, and... Um, he was never really comfortable in the water, so at some point I was like, so I was setting up all the cameras. I was I ended up setting up all the cameras, 
setting up, uh, doing all the light meter readings and things like that, and I would rehearse all the shots, and he just decided that I was the guy to shoot the, the, all the sequences for mm -hmm. the, the torpedoes, everything. And um, so I was happy to do that, and he was dry and I was wet, and I spent many days, you know, 10 to 15 hours underwater. And even though you were spending those, you know, 12 to 15 hour days, probably more like 15 to 17 hour days. Yeah, I mean, even one night I fell asleep <clears throat> underwater. Oh, it was so bad. We were working. It was like one o'clock in the morning, and uh, we had safety cameras mm -hmm. all around. And we had been in the water since like seven a.m. And uh, I just the water was really, really warm. I was having some ear problems, so I didn't want to go back up to the surface until the job was done. And mm -hmm. uh, so I was by my camera, and I was like kind of laying down a little bit, and I slowly I fell asleep. And they saw my bubbles starting to get longer and longer between, uh, <laughs> you know, and they. Finally, the producer uh, cued the underwater yeah, mic. He goes, uh, Tom, Tom, you okay? And I was like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And they're like, okay, we're ready to roll. I'm like, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> so you can fall asleep underwater. No. <laughs> well, you shouldn't. <laughs> Preferably not, but at least the regulator stayed in my mouth. Otherwise, that would have yeah. been a problem. <laughs> um, and so uh, probably from that, you learned a lot of the complexity of having to set up and yeah. manage um, for multiple takes and... Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, that one really, you know, in terms of... That job really taught you how to be patient because yeah. not only you'd learn, well, you got the cameras all ready to go and, 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 but there's other facets to the job that you're not control of. Like in that case, right. we had, uh, you know, we had the model makers, they were building torpedoes, and a lot of times it felt like we were experimenting on, jo mm -hmm. on certain shots, like, you know, we weren't sure. I, I just remember I was shooting a lot of the torpedo runs, and my shot was to get the tail end of the, the torpedo as it passed by, and it would really literally whiz right by my ear. <laughs> and so I would, uh, I'd feel it, I could feel it, because the cable went right by my, mm -hmm. basically my shoulder, and the, the, the torpedoes mm -hmm. were a third size. So they were six feet long, so a regular mm -hmm. normal torpedo is 18 feet. 18 so feet, yeah. we're sitting there, and a few times the uh, torpedoes would break away from the, um, the cables, and they would fly around underwater in the set. So, and then we had, uh, we had safety divers, and they would have to wrangle them back out. So you, know, you never knew if the cable was going to break and it was going to hit you in the back of the head or not. Mm -hmm. so, but that was kind of cool. But, now, um, you mentioned the set. Were you shooting in a tank? Yeah, we were uh, shooting at the uh, Coliseum Stadium uh, pool. It was the, from the 19, you know, the 1932 Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. That's when it was built. It's since been refurbished, but uh, we built a. Uh, we didn't want to shoot nights, mm -hmm. so we sh we uh, we built the building over the entire pool, and mm -hmm. uh, so we could. Uh, and then we'd murk up the water so that it would look like we were in 2,000 feet of water for shooting right. purposes. So we had, you know, that really nice blackish black mm -hmm. uh, background for the, and then we had like <clears throat> track lights over different aspects of, you know, when we did the big submarine blow up and mm -hmm. other, you know, countermeasures and all kinds of explosions and things like that. Yeah, um, and then that led to what was your next um, uh, project? After that, I kind of detoured a little bit. I, I worked for a company called Photosonics. We were shooting a lot on, mm -hmm. um, on uh, Crimson Tide, we were shooting a lot of high speed for slow motion, so mm -hmm. I, we had a Photosonics 4ER camera uh, on the job, and uh, we na uh, nicknamed the uh, housing the Maytag, because it was a big box, and right. it took like about 600 pounds of weight to get it under the water. Yeah. So I would take that thing down, and uh, we'd all manhandle it into position on a staging, but I learned, I worked uh, with Photosonics for a little bit. I kind of got a detour. I was working in uh, high-speed cinematography mm -hmm. in that for a while. And I kind of consider that my master's degree in cinematography because right. I learned a lot working with the technicians and, <clears throat> and dealing with uh, producers and directors and DPs. You know, I worked in the rental department and mm -hmm. um, coordinated all the cameras and, and wherever they went around the world on different jobs. And I just, you know, occasionally I would go out on jobs uh, if some of the techs weren't available. But uh, um, 
but it, it really, I learned a lot about exposure and exposure compensation and lighting and talking to the various technicians. Um, Jim Matlos, who's uh, my presenter, he, he worked mm -hmm. there as well, and just talking with him. And I just learned so much about cinematography, but it reached, was reaching a point that I felt I was getting pulled away from what I really wanted to do, and that was underwater. So at that point, uh, at some point, I just left the company and uh, pounded the pavement, reconnected with some of the people I knew in the underwater world, and bit by bit I got, uh, you know, different jobs here and there. And then I guess uh, I, uh, I got on to uh, Fear Factor, mm -hmm. and I was their underwater cinematographer for all the water unit <coughs> stuff. I didn't do any of the gross-out stuff, but uh, right. I, did yeah. all the, I did all the water stuff, and uh, so I did... Nothing but, and that was another area that I learned a lot about, light, not lighting necessarily, but how lenses and how you deal with uh, refraction of light, especially in, a, in an underwater environment. You mm -hmm. have, you can, uh, if you, a lot of times I want you to shoot something where there's talent and they're fighting or they're going to fall in or they're diving into the water. And if you don't point your camera in the right place, because you have to understand that when what you see going through the water to the surface is not what the lens is going to see when it actually happens, it because actually you get is. that bending of light. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, we have communication and they'll tell you, okay, Tom, we're ready to roll. And then they, oh, we don't like your frame. Can you frame up more? And I'm, I would do it just for that beat, you know, I would set up and then they'd say roll, roll camera and action immediately I would drop the camera down so right. that you never miss the uh, splashdown of, you know, the people fighting because uh, the last thing you want to hear is, oh, we got to do it again, oh, we got to do it again, so you don't want that to happen at all. Right, right. Yeah. Right. And um, you were talking about um, the whole aspect of following the action. Um, learning to anticipate human behavior yeah. and, and yeah. human movement is another aspect of absolutely being a, yeah. a good yeah. cameraman. Yeah, especially, you know, when you do, especially fight sequences that start on the surface. Mm -hmm. You know, you're down there in the water, they're just like, you know, we're rolling camera and then you're waiting and waiting and there's whole fight sequences and then they'll tell you, okay, get ready, they're gonna come in and then you have to be, you know, you have to be on. Uh, and, and talent doesn't always do it the same way every time. You know, if we do multiple takes, you know, they'll, they change somehow. It's just human nature. They just don't do it the same. I've done, you know, commercials with uh, Olympic swimmers and uh, divers and things like that. And every time they dive in, it's different. And um, so you just have to be careful about that. Yeah. And um, I noticed that on your, um, on your website that uh, you had done some spots, again, coming back to high speed. Right. Uh, where you're doing, you know, extreme slow motion mm -hmm. footage underwater and, and uh, split shots above, right. above and below. Right, right. And, oh, and split shots, yeah, you have to, you have to understand the optics of your your lenses and things like that. And generally underwater, we like to use wide lenses. Mm -hmm. And um, because we, as the underwater operator, we're kind of the steady cam underwater. We move in and out. We're supposed to be fluid, obviously, no pun intended. But um, you need to, uh, you know, you need to know. So a lot of times when I uh, come onto a job and I know if they've sent me the boards, mm -hmm for, the, for the, uh, the job and I see certain things and then I know what to order in terms of equipment. If I know there's gonna be a split shot or they want this nice surface shot with the water, I usually order like a, what we call a floaty. And, um, and then I always have a, a dome port and a flat port mm -hmm. for, uh, for the job. Um, if you're, if strictly underwater, then I tend to use the dome port mm -hmm. because the dome port will maintain the angle of coverage of the lens that you're using. So if you're underwater with an, uh, uh, I use a 20 millimeter for easy math, but if you're u underwater, you have a 20, 20 millimeter lens, it'll remain a 20 millimeter lens. But if you put a, a flat port on, it's gonna be 25% longer. So mm -hmm. it's not a 20 anymore, it's uh, whatever, 25, 25. And so it's a little bit longer. And, but if you're shooting split shots, you, we generally then will use a flat port. Yeah. And that way you can split, split it so that you, your lens is seeing everything relatively clearly. And the, the dome port will work too, but then you have an issue with uh, potential vignetting on the edges mm -hmm. of the frame. So 
and with the flat port, you don't have that. Right. So we'll split it, and then of course we do other things like we put Rain-X on the on the port, so the water just kind of if there's any water, we, it drips right off. So we always, you know, that's why we use, you know, we have the different ports. Sometimes we use diopters because if the director of photography wants to use uh, certain lenses, uh, some len we always want close focus lenses, and mm -hmm. some lenses don't focus close enough. Right. So we bring in diopters to pull that in, so we can. Okay. Stuff like that. Um, one of the uh, things I want to discuss with you is uh, color. Uh, when shooting underwater, you have almost a monochromatic look, a heavy saturation of blues mm -hmm. because of the filtration of light coming right. through right. the liquid. And right. so, could you talk about a little bit about how you manage that? How do you manage to get color back into the sure. scene? Sure. Sure. Well, we usually. Um, the color spectrum, I always use Roy G. Biv as my, mm -hmm. my color spectrum, because uh, the reds, the oranges, the yellows, the greens, the blues, and the indigos. The reds are the first to go. In the first 10 feet, you lose your reds. And, uh, and it depends on where you are, you know, shooting. Like if you're shooting in the tropics, they, they, they won't wash out that quickly. And if you're near the surface, you don't lose that much color. Mm -hmm. But when you start getting down to your 20s, your 30s, uh, or even you know 20 or 30 feet away from your talent, there's a lot of blue. Mm -hmm. So that's what we use. We bring in lights. And, and most of the time, in my experience, we use uh, HMIs. So we bring in daylight so that the color spectrum is pretty much you know, what it is. And um, sometimes we'll shoot a chip chart Mm -hmm. uh, just to make sure that uh, when we're at a certain depth, they can, you know, you have a chip chart. I have a you can, poor man, I bring a poor man's color chart down with right. me sometimes mm -hmm. if I'm on my own and um, I don't have like a line to the surface and I'll just shoot the chip chart. You know, if I'm at 50 feet, I'll shoot a chip chart and then. Uh, and that's a reference for the time. It gives them, yeah. So, and then you, and of course we have lights and uh, we're always, if you're going to go below like, you know, 20 feet or more. I usually have some lighting. I mean, I've been on jobs like in, uh, I was on a job in uh, Mexico and I actually, it, it's hard. I, I don't like to abuse my crew, but if there's times I've had, uh, you know, can, uh, guys swimming with mm -hmm. big HMIs, you know, lugging as we're shooting, you know, talent as they're swimming along just right. to make sure we have some lighting. And that's usually how, I mean, it's just light. You got to bring light in if you want to keep the colors. You can't really fix it in post, I don't think. I've never seen it done. You might right. bring some of it back, but. Right, and uh, the type of lights that you're using, you're are you using the uh, Hydroflex or? Yeah, yeah, I strictly, I pretty much only use Hydroflex lighting, yeah. and I use their, uh, they have their Hydropars. I use the Pars, those. Yeah, right. they have Hydropars, and they have the C Pars. The C Par was the original underwater mm -hmm. light or underwater Par light. Um, so I use a lot of, I usually use their uh, 1200 HMIs. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> with the lighting, you could do whatever you want underwater as you can on the on land. You know, when they asked, they, sure. you know, I said you could pretty much do whatever you want. You can gel them, you can scrim them. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can do, you know, you can be creative with the lighting. I know a lot of times, a lot of jobs, you know, they'll will bring in different lights and they like to party gel them because it's like a big party sequence or whatever it may mm -hmm. be the case. So. Now moving from uh, film to the high end digital mm -hmm. um, to the. Ultra HD or HD. Um, did you see any benefit in the fact that the sensors are a little more um, uh, sensitive to daylight? Then, um, it's hard. I, it's hard to say because I have a DIT. They are usually mm -hmm. DIT, so I don't know to be honest. Don't really, with you. but I mean, I, I know certain. Uh, I, my preference, if I'm shooting in the digital world, is the Alexa. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's the you know the most film film centric and right. um, I've used you know I've used the uh, the red camera systems and all that but I mm -hmm. always prefer if we can get the uh, Alexa um, I think it has you know it looks much much better to me um, so no I don't think it's really changed you know that much I don't think mm -hmm. in my experience so uh, yeah. I mean I. If I have my druthers, I shoot film all the time, but yeah. um, we are in the digital age and it is what it is. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a tool and we just, my job is to do the best, you know, give you the best images with whatever you hand me as a camera. Cause not only, you don't always get the, uh, 
the choice of camera. You know, it's usually, you know, the overall DP who says, well, we're using this camera, that camera. And I've shot everything from, you know, feature films with a 5D to an Alexa. In the um, underwater, things tend to move and float. Right, right. <laughs> so, uh, so, and if you've got lights that are positioned for a certain piece of light falling on a subject, you, you may have that problem of, of having that diver who's handling that light um, actually moving out of range. Right, right. Um, uh, do you find yourself having to do multiple takes because of that factor? No, because most of the guys and women we get, mm -hmm. we try to, they're usually really proficient divers. And that's they know for our crew, you have to be. They know where the water, how, what the yeah. speed of the water is. Yeah, and, and they, where it's they, you know, we know where, you know, we will do a little bit of a rehearsal mm -hmm. and um, we don't move the light that much. And we don't have, it's not very often that it's a free swimming uh, light. So okay. a lot so of times, I mean, we, we bring C stands down there okay. and things like mm -hmm. that. It's more trying to keep the talent in the light mm -hmm. because they don't know. A lot of times, some of the talent I've worked with, they're not real comfortable in the water to begin with. Right. And then to ask them to stay in a certain spot, you know, and to stay there and do a performance. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're nervous enough as it is to be underwater. As soon as you take the, the regulator out of their mouth, sometimes they'll give you like a one second, two second burst of uh, you know, performance, and then they're like bolting to the surface, or, or whatever the case may be. So it's more keeping the town uh, comfortable and in position. And and we've often used, um, uh, you know, to keep them in in some places. Sometimes the platform's built. Sometimes you know we have them where they put a little leash on them so that mm -hmm. they stay in one place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But that, down, you know, that's so they won't the float away. Do. Yeah. yeah, it's more the talent than. Very rarely is it the crew. I, I you know, I've, I've only had a f few experiences with crew where they got. I mean, we were shooting a Rihanna, uh, music video, and uh, we for some reason the DP wanted to use anamorphic lenses, so they were really really wide, and and um, I had a, I didn't hire the underwater crew for that job, but uh, a couple of the guys kept being in the shot, you know, and I finally, you know, because the lenses are so wide, it's like, guys, this is, this is my frame line, you have to be out, you know, and sometimes you have to talk to them like that. Mm -hmm. you know, but. Um, so, uh, you have um, been involved in a number of personal projects as well. Mm -hmm. um, why don't we talk a little bit about that? Okay. And um, Sure. Um, I, I've, personal projects, I, I mean, I do a lot of environmental stuff and, mm -hmm. um, uh, currently, I'm working on a project on ghost nets, which is uh, um, abandoned fishing gear, which basically remains destructive and things like that. So I've been working on something like that. Uh, I worked on an IMAX project, which mm -hmm. we, yes. you know, I think it's sort of on the back burner now because it's just really, really difficult to get funding. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to do a lot of environmentally themed projects. It's kind of my first love is wildlife and nature. So those those are some of the things I've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now is it it's the manatee project manatee, that is yeah, um, yeah. that you've been following, and yeah. um, that goes back to some of your early diving experiences. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I used to come. Well, I lived, when I lived in Florida, I used to go over to Crystal River a lot during the winter months when the manatees mm -hmm. were, uh, would come in. And, Great, yeah. Um, before the, all, a lot of the different restrictions is what goes on over there now. But um, so I, I just fell in love with them. I mean, I think they're, you know, a terrific animal and um, they're, um, you know, living in such close proximity to, you know, civilization and people, they, they seem to, you know, have hung on and uh, they're just an incredible animal. I mean, and they're, uh, they're gentle, they, you know, and they're, they're just kind of cool. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And as some of your other projects have been, um, you've done a project, uh, Aquarium of the Pacific, Shark Lagoon. And yeah, that was actually a commercial. Mm -hmm. um, they, um, the aquarium, um, opened up an exhibit on, on sharks and that was a commercial for the uh, the aquarium. So that was kind of fun to shoot and get it. I mean, I'm, I've done sharks before, but it, you know, here we were in captive 
with him with the family and everything like that. And it was kind of an interesting project because, um, you know, there the um, producer and director had never done much in the underwater world, so he had to real. It sort of like had to hold their hand quite a bit, you know, tell them explain things, you know, in terms of how things work, which I, you do a lot as a you know, working in underwater or some, you know, specialized, I think you, you know, you come on as the expert and uh, I come on and I just, I don't try to tell them what to do. I just kind of give them the, this is what's going to happen. I kind of like advise and then they can decide right. what they want to yeah. go from there. And sometimes they, they take my advice and sometimes they don't. And then we do it and then they go, oh, this isn't working. Why? And I said, well, because you didn't do this and this. And then we go and we, we do it my way and, and hopefully it works the way they want it. Yeah, and uh, it, I'm sure you, having worked with a number of different directors, you can see the different directing styles. Mm -hmm. And uh, so just just a word or two about how you've managed different uh, director personalities. Sure, some, some directors are um, really poor communicators. I've had that issue, and usually if... Um, you know, they they tell me one thing and then they meet, they don't tell me exactly. And I no. I go and I set up the shot and then they come over and they go, no, 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 no. And I go, oh, okay, I thought this is what you meant. And, you know, you kind of be diplomatic. I don't want to mm -hmm. step on anybody's toes. So, oh, okay, I said, well, it'll only take us a couple of seconds to, you know, rechange it or whatever. And that's what you do. And then you have others that are very hands-on and very specific. And they're like, this is the shot on the board. This is what we want. And they're very savvy about working underwater and... Uh, um, and a lot of times you deal with the assistant director, or at least I do. I'll, mm -hmm. He's kind of my, my go-between between between me and the director. Yes, I'll work with the director. I'll get his concept of what he's trying to do. But then it's, it seems like I mostly will work between the DP and the AD. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and I kind of talk to them. And, and most of the times they, they understand what's going on and they, they get it. Um, you know, and, and sometimes you feel, you know, intimidated um, to talk to somebody who, uh, not long ago I worked on um, a feature film with Tom Stern, who is mm -hmm. Clint Eastwood's sure. uh, uh, DP. And um, we were shooting some underwater stuff and uh, sequences, and uh, they wanted a certain framing, and I felt awkward because I kind of went up to Tom and I said... Um, uh, we got a problem. I said, you're kind of boning me. And I, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I got all these lights and you want me to shoot that way and I can't, I see all your lights. And he, and he's like, oh, okay. Cause you never know how somebody's going right. to react sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, this is the way I want it. And, mm -hmm. um, but he was very, very good. About, he was very nice about it. And he says, oh yeah. He says, yeah, we are screwing you over there, aren't we? So they moved all the lights and everything worked out fine. But you know, sometimes, mm -hmm. um, you know, you got different personalities and you just kind of, you know, you deal with it. I've, you know, I've had difficult directors and I can see that they're, they're that way and I try to avoid the dark side, so to speak. So, like, yeah. my camera assistant, I'll tell them, listen, we don't ever want to hear we're waiting on camera or anything like that. Let's just right. be always ready and ready to go. And so we, we've been pretty successful in that regard because it's, uh, I don't know, I just don't want to deal with it. Yeah. Because you know, I've heard horror stories. Absolutely. Where do you see yourself moving? I I know, noticed that um, your your credits are mostly as an operator, mm -hmm. which is your craft. But you have a credit um, underwater DP on yeah. Broken Horses. Yeah, Broken Horses. That was the one with uh, Tom Stern, and mm -hmm. uh, I came. He hired me as the underwater DP. I did all the lighting for the for the underwater um, sequences. We had a uh, it was one night, and uh, it was a big explosion mm -hmm. sequence where the, um, um, I guess it's a cabin in the woods on a on a pond or lake or whatever, and the town is supposed to be running away from this cabin, and it just blows up, and then this big fireball goes over, over the water. So um, my job was to make sure that when he uh, dove into the water, you could see his face and everything like right. that. So um, I. Uh, shot it with a bunch of a um, couple of HMIs and um, well not a couple but a few and then um, some uh, kinos mm -hmm. you know daylight kinos and things like that so we just kind of wanted to fill a little bit not a lot because you know the fire itself was going to be 
probably giving us a lot of light and um and that was a film job which was cool but a little bit you get nervous because you know if it doesn't happen right then you know but anyway so uh when uh, we rolled camera, they was rolled camera in action, and uh, the, the uh, talent ran in, dove in, thing fireball went right over, and everything worked perfectly. I mean, and I it was one of those moments where I go, "Whoa, that was cool," you know. And I don't do that very often, but that was a pretty cool shot. And I was like, "We nailed that one." And uh, so uh, we came up to the surface, and sometimes they'd like to do a safety take, and. Uh, but Tom was like, no, we nailed it. We're we got going it. On, yeah. Moving on. And that, that was kind of nice. Yeah. You know, get a little validation. Well, he's probably used to doing that with Clint Eastwood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no slowing down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was nice. He was very, very good about it. Even the director, because he was from India. He's um, a Bollywood director doing Hollywood now. So mm -hmm. uh, he was very nice about it. And we did a bunch of other stuff. And other sequences with uh, some swimming and things like that. So we had to move the lights around a lot just because mm -hmm. of everything that was going on. So it was a pretty pretty uh, busy night. Yeah. Um, hello, my name is Kevin. I'm Hi, in Kevin. the film degree. I just wanted to know, does the rules change underwater as far as camera shots and how you want to capture things? In the sense, like, there are certain rules to, like, horror movies, how you portray the bad guy or the villain or the killer. But when you're underwater and you're shooting a shark, it looks scary from almost any angle. Yeah. Is, is there any type of rules that flip upside down or? Um, I mean, it's sort of like crossing the line or something. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think because underwater it's three dimensional, we don't worry too much about the line, if that's what you're talking about. But as far as you know, uh, portraying you know the villain versus the good guy. It's hard to do because usually when you're doing that, they're usually in a fight sequence. So it's very frenetic. And um, so my job is sometimes, uh, you know, I usually get right in there with them. So I'm usually very, very close because I'm on a wide angle lens. So my, my job is to make sure I don't get in the way. And uh, so, and I try, because uh, usually they want the close up, the close up of the face of each person maybe underwater so my job is to in that frenetic dealing with people that aren't on air and I am that there are at some point they somebody might just like go like I'm out of air I want to go to the surface or something like that and in that brief few seconds I've got to get as many shots of coverage as I can you know sometimes they want to see the hands you know like they're fighting with their hands or they're throwing punches and and then you want the you know the big eyeballs that sometimes they want that so you know you got to push in and um I worked with uh Damian Lewis uh you know the actor from Homeland and um he's a really really good actor really nice guy and um he, he kept asking me, he's like, well, where's the camera going to be? And I basically finally had to tell him, I said, don't worry about the camera, just do your performance and I'll get your shots. And he was like f totally trusting that I would do that. And um, so you, some, some actors will ask, you know, but it's like, they can't see. You know? <laughs> so it's like, how you, you know, it's like, you know, where the camera isn't going to really matter too much, I don't think. But so, yeah, you know, you just, you just in this frenetic scene or, you know, they'll have different shots, like when they're swimming. If they're doing swimming, you want to make sure. It's usually we try to get the facial. A facial. We usually get like a long shot. If there's a long swimming shot, you usually try to push in so that they don't have to go too far. But you always want to get the face. Seems to be, at least in uh, all my experience in TV shows and features where talent is involved. All right, thank you. Yeah. So do they give up asking you to get their good side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never heard anybody <laughs> say that to me yet. <laughs> Yeah, every side's good. We have a question from online. Uh, there's an online question. Is staying active and healthy a big part of your routine? Yes, absolutely, yes. I, um, I'm in the water probably, I don't know, uh, a lot. Uh, for one. <laughs> I mean, I, I dive a lot. I'm always in, it seems like even on my days off, I'm in the water somewhere. Um, some of the, the jobs I do are require, you know, I use, uh, not, not production jobs per se, but some of the, I do a lot of still work as well. And so some of my still work has uh, taken me into the, the realm of technical diving. So I'm wearing more tanks and everything like that. So yes, I, I work out, I, I go to a gym, I do aerobics, I swim. Um, 
albeit I'm like a tank in the water, but I swim. <laughs> and uh, so, and I lift weights and everything like that. So, and I, I probably, you know, my diet is probably relatively healthy. So, yeah, you got to be because you don't, I mean, it, it's, the equipment is, can be pretty heavy. And, and, and the amount of time you spend in the water can be tiring. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that you might have to deal with is parasites in the water and things like that. <laughs> So yeah. do, do you I, I have haven't any, any problems. Uh, ear infections are usually the biggest yeah. thing you have to deal with, you know, anywhere you go. But speaking of parasites, the only time I got concerned, I was working in the Amazon, mm -hmm. and we were shooting um, the river dolphins there, and we were up in the, you know, the rainforest and everything like that. And so um, the producer and the director, the producer slash director I wasn't very comfortable with, but... Um, uh, so we were at a location where we were filming the dolphins and the, um, the local guy told me, he says, you know, you have to be out of the water by five o'clock. And I was like, why? And he said, well, there's something that's in the bottom of the, the river that at night it comes up and if it gets inside you, you know, the treatment is pretty, pretty bad, that you, so bad that you'd rather be pretty dead. Pretty painful, yeah. Yeah, so I was like, oh, okay. So I told the producer director, I said, well, we have to be out of the water every day at 4.30. You know, because I know there's going to be an early bird. There's going to be that one parasite that's yeah. going to come and find me. So and I'm they're going like, to get me out of here. And they're going to be asking for that one shot extra. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I don't know if they were pulling yeah. my legs. You know, they tell you all kinds of things when you go to the Amazon, especially when you go in the river and you're swimming yeah. in the river. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So I didn't like the guy that I was working with, unfortunately. And um, so it was my way to cut the day short. It was like, hey, we got to be out by 4.30. He says, this thing's coming. I'm not going to be in the water. <laughs> so it could have been a ghost for all I know. Okay. All right. Do we have another question here? Uh, have you had any close calls with wildlife or um, even like uh, actors surfacing too quickly or panicking underwater? Um. We've had, I've had actors panic, um, uh, close calls with wildlife. Um, I don't know, maybe alligators. <laughs> I did a job for the Discovery Channel and was, we were uh, shooting some alligators and we were attacked by the, the gators, but that's probably the closest call I ever had. Um, sharks never had a problem. Uh, talent for the most part, they're they, I've been pretty lucky. Um, uh, the biggest thing you have to be concerned with talent is, and hopefully, um, because they're not all scuba certified, so you have to make sure that they get a day. I, I have a, uh, a stunt coordinator, water safety coordinator, and um, if, if we get a job and we have talent and they're not certified, but they're gonna do, be on, on a, uh, a hookah rig, which is basically a long hose from a tank, because uh, they don't wear the tank. Uh, we just have to make sure that they get a day or some time with that person to let, let them understand that they can't hold their breath. You know? and then, but then you're asking them to do a performance at 10 feet without showing bubbles. So you, you, you know, it's kind of like this catch-22. You don't want to see the bubbles coming out of their mouth, but then you want to make sure that if they do panic that they know to blow. But you know, in, in 10 feet of water, it can be pretty critical even in that shallow. So, yeah, so, I mean, I haven't seen, I haven't had it happen yet. I uh, hope it never does. So, uh, but uh, we have to make sure that the people that surround them are really, really good at what they do. Now, that, that leads me to a question. Um, how much extra time do you allot to an underwater sequence that you wouldn't allot to um, a land sequence? On dry? Mm -hmm. um, the general rule of thumb is whatever it takes. We, you know, when a producer asks me, he says, "Well, how long is this going to take, and or how long will it take to do this sequence?" I usually say, "Figure out what it'll take you on a stage and double it," and that's usually okay. how we kind of a rule of thumb. I mean, it doesn't always happen that way. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes when they're shooting other sequences, like dry sequences, sequences, they forget that there's an underwater crew. I've had that happen on a TV show. Um, I think it was Martha Coolidge was the director and they were shooting a bunch of sequences all night. And then they realized they had this underwater shot and they were going, getting ready to go into overtime with the crew and the director of photography comes running up to me. He says, how soon can you be ready? And I said, well, we're ready now. So it's like, 
they came running down. They put the, the, the actor in the water. We did the scene. We took like, I think we did one or two takes and then that, they were gone. And it was like, literally the entire crew was gone. And we were, my, my assistant and I were left <laughs> to pack up the gear because we'd come in later. So we weren't in yeah. overtime, but the rest <laughs> of the crew would have been in overtime. But sometimes they, we see it a lot. They'll forget that there's... Um, that all the specialty rigs. Yeah, yeah, they forget. They'll forget about the Steadicam guy. Yeah, they yeah, forget they, about the. Uh, yeah, they forget. I mean, uh, he, the crane setup yeah, and yeah. <laughs> remote I mean, heads and yeah. whatever. Yeah. I worked on Lucky You, and uh, they had, gave us a 6 a.m. call, and we didn't start mm -hmm. shooting until 12 midnight. Yeah. And so we just I've sat around for the whole day. <laughs> been and, there, done that. Yeah. yeah so yeah. they tend to forget. Mm hmm. So you kept mentioning uh, underwater lighting and things like that. Do you still use traditional lighting techniques like three-point and stuff like that, or do you use unique lighting techniques for underwater? Um, I think we start out, you know, with a, you know, we try to start with something, you know, that's key, but it, you, the thing you have to, uh, I think I, the thing I have to look at when I'm lighting or thinking about lighting is, it, you know, where is it coming from in terms of the, uh, the shot? Um, you know, motivation. It, yeah, so yeah. it's a, it's where it's being motivated from. You don't want it to come. You know, you don't want light necessarily coming underneath somebody, because uh, uh, light doesn't come up off the bottom and things like that. So you have to, you know, I start out thinking traditional, and then I go from there, uh, and then it depends. You know, yeah. depends on the shot. And the other problem is if you over light, top light, then it looks like daylight kind yeah. of filtering down. Yeah, it, you get those god rays. If it's the wrong time of day, then mm -hmm. that would give it away. Right, right. I mean, I've even had, I, I worked on a commercial, um, uh, it's a TLC spot, I think it's on the summer anthem. Uh, but um, it actually was raining that day, and the producers were getting really, really anxious that we hadn't rolled any film yet. And so... Um, the uh, DP had come up to me, he hadn't done much underwater at all, so he came up and he said, well, what can we do? And I said, well, how many 18Ks do you have? And so we brought, some, brought them in and we just you know, lit up the whole pool because it was supposed to look like a summer day. Yeah. And so I said, just bring them in and let's just, you know, we could shoot something. They had, a, I think, a shot they wanted with a flip-flop just drifting down. So I said, well, let's do that, it's simple. So we just lit the hell out of it so it looked like that nice blue because it was a small area. So we made sure it looked like a really daylight day and we did that. And um, fortunately, right after we shot that, the clouds were already starting to break up, but then the sun came out so we were able to do everything else and it turned out to be a really cool spot. But you know, sometimes you have to, you know, but it's all based on motivation where it's coming from. So I usually try to, you know, come from different angles that is all the the time that we've got but thank all right you. okay we're good thank you awesome good job guys thank you.